All right. All right. Good evening, okay. everyone. Welcome to the November 10th Housing Steering Committee meeting. I'm going to take roll. Council Member Haroff? Yes, I'm here. Council Member Paulson? Here. Council Member Kunstler is absent, or sorry, Planning Commissioner. He's former Planning Commissioner Kunstler is absent. And uh, Planning Commissioner Wagstaff? Here. All right, so we have a quorum. And the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the October 12th, 2022 meeting. I move to approve. I'll second. Council Member Haroff? Yes. Council Member Paulson? Yes. And Commissioner Wagstaff? Yes. All right, the minutes are approved. Thanks. And then we're going to move on to our only discussion item, which is um, to review the first draft of the objective design standards that we received. So I'm going to turn it over to you, David, to um, make a presentation. Great. Thank you, Elise. Um, and thank you to all of you guys who are um, uh, here today to, to listen to this. I know that we provided the draft uh, last week, but I also know it's over 160 pages. Um, so there's, there's no way that anyone could actually have read it in that time reasonably. Uh, so what we plan to do tonight is to hit over some high points, um, be responsive to some of the things that we've heard at the last meeting, um, and kind of touch the big concepts of what we're doing and get your feedback. Uh, and then, you know, we would welcome your feedback with a more thorough review of the, the draft document uh, after this meeting um, as we try to work towards completing it. Good, thank so, you. Um, there is, there is no public now, so I can dispense to some extent with um, sort of the background and understanding that, um, uh, that we do have a little bit of a uh, time constraint. So um, Ryan and I are gonna try to keep this presentation to probably about a half an hour or a little less. Uh, and then from that, we just want to hear from you. That's really our purpose here is to, to hear what you think and get your thoughts on the direction. So um, let me put this in presentation mode and we will get going here. That's a uh, great photo. Yeah, I found this. I found this on the Internet and, you know, the Internet says everything. And I thought this was great because it really helps you understand kind of the location of Larkspur in relationship to the bridge and the bay and all that. Mm, that's um, a great photo. That's great. Um, so just generally, uh, you know, a lot of people have asked where the odds apply and why we're doing the odds. I, I think, you know, everyone here understands the purpose of it. So I'm not going to go to through this with any great detail. Um, certainly SB 35 is a, a huge driver, but other things like SB 330 um, certainly have uh, play a role in that. SB 9, uh, there are separate guidelines for SB 9 that have been created by Opticos. That could be in a whole nother conversation. Um, but it's really an opportunity for the city of Larkspur to protect itself um, as developers come in in the future and use SB 35 as a mechanism to gain approvals. Um, so the odds that you've seen before um, was the large document that was about 360 pages and it, it was broken down into all of these zones. Um, it focused on building types and architectural designs sort of as the mantle in which everything was built. Um, it included some other chapters that dealt with signage um, and large sites, but all in all, it was really designed for, uh, you know, for the county of Marin and to encompass everything that is in the county. So it is our job to try to slim it down to something that fits uh, the fits Larkspur. So the document that we've produced as a draft is 162 pages down from 360. So we've taken about 200 pages out. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is is we needed to design a document that actually was a, about Larkspur. <laughs> like it wasn't about Marin, Ross, or anything else. It was specific to, right. to your city. Um, so I think we've really done that. Um, and you've given a lot of careful thought and we're gonna spend, I would say, at least half the presentation talking about that. Um, and of course, you know, we've we've really focused on on creating a document that works on the envelope and form-based code as opposed to using architectural typologies that might be outdated. Um, and this way, I think it provides more freedom with still the control that you need um, to guide development in the future. Um, so from a style standpoint, we've, you know, per the comments that we heard from all of you, we have kind of removed the style and, and replaced it with something we think that's more adequate long-term. So to try to understand how we've reduced uh, the 360-page document to the 160-page document, 
Um, you know, we, we've combined some chapters. Uh, the sign types chapter we have removed, and I think what we've discussed with everybody is that is a standalone chapter that the city of Larkspur, Larkspur could could enact in its own zoning at a later date as a standalone. Um, it doesn't need to be in here because this these, this document is for multifamily residential design. Um, there may be some mixed use with commercial on the ground floor. Those commercial uses can refer back to uh, the city of Larkspur sign standards. And then how do we work with this? So one of the problems that, that we had just as, as architects looking at the document is when we went through the original document, we found ourselves jumping back and forth through the document, you know, sort of trying to, to game out how you would use it if you were a developer. So we simplified it so that we kind of put the introduction all up front with the zones and uses so you can start there and look at your site and say, okay, my site is in zone T4 and, and this is how I use this book. And then chapter three tells you what you can actually do, what your allowable building area is, how much parking is required. Uh, and then uh, chapter four deals with, you know, site design, fences, things like that. Um, chapter five, we left in, which is frontages. Um, and then we moved materials into that to kind of combine those two, because that really is how the building appears to the street and how it um, addresses the street. And then we have a large sites chapter um, six, which um, we're gonna discuss that briefly. It's possible we may not need that. I think there's a discussion we can have amongst all of us about whether there are enough large sites to really warrant it or whether we've really provided enough information in chapter three in terms of what people could do to it. So some of the key comments we, we, we heard um, in our previous meeting, um, how can we revise the odds to address Larkspur? Um, Let's get rid of the typologies and the architectural design style chapter um, and try to replace it with something that's more form based. Um, there's always a big question about parking, and we're going to devote a section of this presentation to discuss that. Um, and how does the odds uh, manage to deal with slope sites, which, you know, Larkspur has a fair number of, of slope sites. And I think one of the things that uh, has been confusing to understand is how does the number of stories and height reflect? Uh, or be solved on a slope site? Like, how does a developer work through that? Um, and then how do we maintain quality over scale and materials without having, you know, design styles like they had in Chapter 8 previously? And then I, I mentioned we removed the, the signage chapter. Could I interject? So, this is Kevin. Yeah, Could I interject please, real quick? Yeah. Just, a, just a footnote. And mm -hmm. it really we don't, doesn't require a conversation. But yeah. one of the things that um, I kind of regret <laughs> um, uh, in, in, in retrospect is that the city enacted an ordinance to deal with um, uh, increasing height limitations for structures on sloped uh, lots about a year or so ago, maybe a little bit more than that. And it's been it's been um, taken advantage of because it wasn't restricted to sl sloped lots. It just was an increase in the height limitation to avoid design review. That was the, that was the purpose of it. May not be yeah. relevant in this context, but I'd, I'd really like to take, you know, have us make sure that we're doing something that's appropriate in terms of our height allowances so that we, we have something that actually makes sense for properties that actually do have sloped properties as yeah. opposed to just pr properties that are taking advantage of it willy-nilly. Okay, that's just the footnote. It just, yeah. just right no, raised my, my attention. I think I think that's great, and I think that's why this question has been raised, you know, is because it is a place where developers could take advantage if it's not carefully sort of planned out. Uh, and, that, and I guess that's what resonated with me, because that's exactly what has happened with our ordinance. Um, and I, I want to avoid that. Yeah, the slopes are tricky, and there are there are developable slope sites. I mean, we, we know of, a yeah, couple of course. Um, so that are that are planning to develop, so it is important. Right. Okay. Um, when we talked to you last time, we we had roughly decided to use five of the different zones um, that you see here on the screen as we actually started working through the zoning um, the objective design development standards we realized that the t4 cms um, was kind of covered with the t4 sms and the t4 sn and what you're going to see uh, in, in what ryan's going to present on chapter three is we kind of rebuilt that entire section and that that's sort of the 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 meat of this uh, stand of the standards because it, it it gives you the volume and the setbacks and the height and everything um, so we tried to simplify it a little further 
And um, the four that we're sticking with at this point are the, the, the ones you see here, the edge neighborhood, suburban neighborhood, the suburban Main Street small, and then the core Main Street. And how that plays itself out roughly in your current uh, land use pattern, the R1 uses uh, are the T3 ENs, of course, and then uh, the other uses are kind of distributed out. But you notice that the, the T5 CMS, which is the highest intensity transit area, is the area of the Marin Country Mart, the, the Cinemark that just went out, uh, the ferry terminal, um, and then, of course, down here, the, the Cost Plus site. Um, that's really where we've got the walkability and the public transit infrastructure to allow for density without having a huge negative impact, you know, on the traffic. Um, so with that, I wanted to I want to hand it off to Ryan to walk over the meat of Chapter Three in terms of how um, how we've kind of taken the typologies out and replaced them with a form based code that is really specific to Larkspur. So Ryan. Great. So uh, one of the very first things that we we do in, in these exercises, we try to find, you know, inspiration uh, on your own streets and King Street, um, Locust, uh, you know, these streets that are right next to your your downtown Main Street, which are probably your some of your oldest urban fabric, uh, had some really interesting examples to consider on how to introduce multiple units on a site on a parcel, but in a way that is charming or feels in tune with uh, the scale of your downtown. And so the T3 typology, which is assigned to all the, the single family zoning, kind of the key element there is not seeing townhomes uh, or not seeing, you know, flats. And so the, the concept that we've done in the massing is to kind of learn from these examples look at kind of the uh, general girth of the of the buildings, their width and their length, and then institute planning uh, that allows for those massing elements to have multiple units, but in a way that feels like a single family home um, texture. So uh, some of the interesting things to look at, uh, these units, uh, multiple units, they blend up single family homes, uh, they share a curb cut quite frequently, uh, not all, but most of them do. And then multiple units share a curb cut. And then the parking approach kind of varies. It looks like some of the units might have more generous parking allotments than others. Um, and it was a little difficult to tell if some of the single wide garages were tandem or not. But generally, close to the downtown area, it's uh, the parking is a little tighter. Uh, next slide. For the next step up, which is T4, uh, we looked at your examples of townhomes uh, and, and some flats, uh, condominiums that are in uh, your city. And so there are quite a few, maybe 1960s, 70s, 80s era um, projects uh, that have a, a range of configurations where uh, they either have a, a formal streetscape with uh, driveways off of that, or they have a consolidated parking approach, and, and these things play a big role in kind of the character and walkability of the projects. Uh, then in some cases, they have uh, corralled parking where the parking is collected in parking lots, and then there's kind of an internal network of uh, public spaces. Um, so we, we take those considerations into account. Uh, you know, some of the primary goals that we're trying for in terms of consistency across all, all the typologies is that all of the new projects introduce a much more walkable public space framework. So um, we, we learn from these examples, but in some cases we, we don't uh, embrace some of the more auto-oriented characteristics. Uh, next slide. The, uh, this is essentially equivalent to the T4 SMS uh, and looking at how, how did they do housing in your existing downtown? And they're actually, isn't a ton of housing uh, in the downtown. There's some interesting kind of ad hoc examples. I noticed uh, that in the case on the top upper on the upper left, they took an extremely narrow site and stacked the units um, uh, uh, on top of the parking uh, on the the site that's right <coughs> behind the hotel, which is just on the the lower part of the slide. Uh, they have uh, tandem parking under under units. Um, and then uh, the example on the upper right, uh, the parking is in a lot where there might have been a building at a previous time, but it's not 
you know, integrated into the building itself. So uh, those are kind of examples where I think they may do uh, with the constraints, the physical constraints they had because they had very small lots. Uh, next slide. Just a, just another comment um, on that. There's a lot of bad ar architecture from from those days, and um, although they may be uh, representative to some extent of the housing stock that we have in our community, um, I, would, I would hate to see them reproduced going forward. That's yeah, and 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 we we agree with that for sure. We would just kind of want to understand what you have. No, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, it kind of helps us to, to move forward. Um, so in looking for, you know, where do we put the slightly taller housing? And that was where the uh, area around Marine Country Mart seemed a natural fit. There was some precedent for um, four-story structures there already, um, though these, these were especially auto-oriented. And it was interesting just trying to get from one of the units um, towards the back of the hillside uh, the most convenient path to get down to Marin Country Mart, most of it was walking down a drive aisle, you know, with, right. with, with without right. proper sidewalk definition. Right. And uh, so that's something that we definitely want to rectify, you know, and with your input, we've taken a first stab at how to do that. And some of that, a lot of that thinking actually was incorporated into um, the, the, the Marin odds template. Um, but we've, We've kind of made some modifications because some of the solutions they had didn't work with sloped sites. Um, my, I think, biggest critique of some of the existing um, four-story housing types that you have, aside from the auto orientation, is also the public spaces are very removed. They're interior, inward-looking, and uh, they're not along kind of usable paths of travel frequently, so they end up a little unpopulated. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what we want to try to do is set up standards where the natural path of travel is a nice one, and it's part of the the um, recreation space amenities or the gathering space amenities. Mm -hmm. um, next slide. So uh, this dive, the next four slides will dive into some of the controls, and there's a lot more detail on all of these controls in the PDF, but this will give you a little introduction. So for T3, uh, the concept was, you know, we're going to uh, set up a system where, say, a developer ends up with a 300 foot length of or 250 foot length of parcel that they need to subdivide uh, into units. What we didn't want was a 240 foot building because uh, that would be out of scale. Uh, even if it was a low height, it'd be out of scale with the existing homes in the T3 uh, zones. So what we did is we basically said, you are limited to a 75 foot lot uh, subdivision. And for every one of those 75 foot lots, um, you're gonna have side setbacks, rear setbacks, front setbacks. And essentially what it does is it, it, it gives um, kind of the cadence uh, spatial cadence of a single family home neighborhood so that there's a building, a, a different building every 75 feet as a maximum width. Um, the standards also support subdividing a 75 lot into smaller lots. So there's some flexibility there because undoubtedly there's going to be irregular lots in Larkspur with its topography. But what this does is it sets a maximum so that we don't get buildings that are out of scale with um, uh, the finer grain, especially in terms of duplexes uh, and triplexes. Now, there might be some really large, gracious, big single family homes in Larkspur uh, that mansions essentially that have bigger lots, and that's fine. Um, but for the duplex, triplex product, I think we want to kind of minimize the physical presence of those so they don't dominate small existing homes in the area. Uh, so what we've done uh, is we've got a 60 foot max width, uh, a 78 foot max depth, but in that max width and max depth, you have to have two masses. So there's uh, a set of tighter controls for what we're calling the primary massing and a set of controls for the secondary massing. And so that, that mass gets broken down into smaller forms, which is fairly consistent with a lot of the architecture that you see uh, in your older neighborhoods. Uh, next slide. 
So in the T4SN designation, which is an area where basically we allow townhomes, uh, one of the things is we looked at, there are some projects, including in your city, where the length of the townhomes gets a bit long. And it kind of creates a, a less permeable uh, pedestrian district, and it and it also creates kind of a, a, a an architecture that's a little out of the human scale. And so on this uh, on the T4SN, we limited the length of a series of townhomes to 120 feet, and that's something we can. Is that long enough? Is that short enough? It was something where essentially you could have five units comfortably. Uh, a length of five units. Uh, we could make it a shorter length, but the idea was that uh, that that seemed a reasonable length for four or five townhomes, maybe six. Um, and then you have to have a break, and you end up with a a break of uh, fifteen feet between the buildings. Uh, there's also a requirement for open space, and so there becomes a natural diagram for taking your ten percent open space requirement and fitting that where the buildings require a break. Uh, this has slightly different controls where the the depth, uh, you've got a 40 foot depth on the townhomes. Uh, the townhomes are allowed to have wings, so they could get deeper uh, in that uh, by having that wing, but they still have to fit under the max um, uh, length of the building, which is 120 feet. Um, the other interesting thing is a lot of your city doesn't have alleys. There's very few alleys in, in Larkspur. And so looking at how these units might uh, interface with the street, um, front loaded street uh, parking is probably a reality a lot of developers may have to face. Uh, there's been some interesting ways to limit curb cuts where you take two units uh, in this example, but you use one curb cut uh, Albany has been doing this and it creates a slightly, uh, uh, it breaks down the width of the curb cuts on the street, which is nice for parking and also just keeping it pedestrian friendly. Uh, next. So this is uh, heading into the T4 SMS. And the idea here is in the areas that we've colored red uh, throughout your, your city, uh, they would be able to build slightly taller, but we're not increasing um, the the max width of the building. So it still intends to retain that uh, 120 foot uh, length uh, of a building mass uh, before you have to institute um, a, a way to break that up, a, a separation between the buildings. Uh, we have an example of this in the book where we did a test uh, you know, kind of a, a call it a site test on the Lucky's parking lot, uh, showing how that had to be broken up into basically three design sites, or I'm um, sorry, four design sites. Uh, so we can go over that. It, it'll come up a little later in the presentation. Uh, but the the great thing about your downtown is your blocks have an incredible number of buildings on them. It's is, you know, that's part of the charm is you have all these narrow buildings that are stacked together. So the other provision that we put into the T4 SMS is that basically west of the railroad right away. Uh, so it excludes this, this provision excludes the Lucky's parking lot area, but west of that, you cannot consolidate the lots. And what we don't want to happen, I think, to your charming downtown is someone to come in, buy three one-story buildings, tear them down and build you know, a, a four-story single building, and you lose that small town feel, you lose that, uh, you know, diverse buildings. And so the idea is that there is no parcel consolidation allowed in uh, the historic downtown west of the railroad right, right away. Um, and that's the, the threshold is um, a half acre. So uh, the other thing that comes with that is- I'm sorry, when, when you say a threshold is a half acre, what do you mean by that? Well, if your lot is larger than a half acre, and I think the right. only site that gets there is the school, and I don't think the school's going anywhere, but the school site is larger than half an acre, uh, then uh, then you don't, yeah the yeah okay okay yeah so everything else though is is tiny they're like fifty yeah, foot right. parcels so uh, but the the idea is we want to protect that texture 
and and not allow a, a large building to replace four small buildings. We'd all be run out on rails if we did anything otherwise. Yeah, it's it's the defining characteristic of your town, I think, yeah. uh, the, of Magnolia Avenue along that stretch. Um, it's the appeal. So um, next slide. So where you do have room for uh, some more efficient growth, I think, but done in a way that's a little less auto oriented than what's been done already uh, is uh, the utility site, um, Marin Country Mart, some of those areas out there could um, afford larger scale development that helps produce um, the unit yields to help you uh, get to your numbers. And I think it can be done in a way that is very pedestrian friendly, very walkable um, and, and pleasing. And so one, one example that I think has been uh, nicely done, um, it's all subjective, but uh, uh, Bayfront in Hercules uh, is an interesting development where the block sizes are mandated to be fairly small. Uh, the buildings all have walkable pedestrian frontages. Uh, and so I, I think it had, did some really nice things. And some of the lessons, um, well, in some of the ways we've gone a little further than they did. Uh, one of our maximums is that a building length here can only be 300 feet long. And in an urban setting, that's uh, that's a pretty modest length. And so when you hit that 300 foot length, you have to either have a street, a plaza, um, or a uh, paseo. Now, we also have another provision is that a block length can only be up to 500 feet. And so, you know, in theory, you might end up with two buildings along that block length. Uh, but the idea is uh, we want permeability through those blocks. So they're not, uh, so it doesn't become a fortress like pattern. Uh, the other, I think, really important connect, uh, connectivity provision is that we want to have connectivity in two directions. And David, maybe you can show on this example site how we synced up with your cursor to Marin Country Mart on the left, um, you know, line up with an existing drive aisle there. If you go to the north part, there's a, uh, a street connection there. It's a really minor one, but still, this is a way that we can uh, kind of distribute pedestrians and cars more evenly throughout the area. Uh, but that comes down through um, a parcel and then we create a connection point uh, there where the cursor is uh, for another street. And then on the far right, tying into those townhomes and single family homes, uh, there's an existing street there that stops. So picking up on that existing connection, bringing it down the hill, and through over to Marin Country Mart, so those folks can, you know, don't have to go down on Sir Francis Drake. They can mosey on over um, either on pedestrian, bike, or car to Marin Country Mart the other way. So that's one big distinguishing difference between the pattern of development uh, uh, from the 70s and 80s is all of the, the parcels around this are not interconnected. And you go into a project and you circulate in the project but there's no connectivity from project to project except for the uh, perimeter arterials. And uh, that just, it just makes it difficult to get around as a pedestrian. So we thought that was something worth, um, you know, fixing. Um, and then the other part of this is we increase our max wing depth to 70 feet. What that allows is a, a, a double loaded uh, corridor, essentially, where you have apartments on both sides and the central corridor down the middle, which is uh, a very efficient uh, model. And they vary, sometimes they're as narrow as 55 feet, uh, and then sometimes they're as wide as 70 feet. So uh, next slide, David. Oh, actually, I wanna say one quick thing on that previous slide, because it ties into the next slide. Open space, uh, we have a provision that uh, gathering space, actually gathering space is the better word to use, uh, you have a 10% requirement for gathering space. And so per design site. And so in the if you point out, David, the uh, lower right building where it says P, that site, that block there, which has two buildings, has two design sites. And so what you are allowed to do in this district is take your gathering space requirement uh, between two design sites and consolidate it into a larger, you know, more meaningful 
uh, design site. So that one that David's circling right now actually serves both the the building on the left and the building on the right of it. So uh, that's, and then if you go to the next slide, we can talk about that a little bit. So uh, through all the scales, T3, T4, and T5, we require that 10% of the site of the site is dedicated to um, an internal gathering shared common space, and it can be on the street or it can be off the street. Um, but the idea is that there is a you know a relief from the built environment and some and some natural open space. So uh, <clears throat> it it takes a different form uh, in each in each uh, zoning scale. But basically, the minimum dimension of any gathering space <clears throat> has to be 15 feet in one direction and 10 feet in the other, um, which, especially in the T3 um, and T4 requirements, is an important aspect. The, the larger T5 projects uh, require kind of a larger space. So uh, next slide. So getting into uh, slopes, there's plenty of, of uh, hilly terrain in Larkspur. And so we looked at how this was solved uh, by folks and, and development here in Larkspur, and they keep the parking very close to the street, which is not something that was very commonly shown in the stock um, odds template that we were modifying. So we set up uh, a concept which basically follows is if you've got the street, uh, <clears throat> that's probably about the best elevation to set your cars because you don't want your cars going up a steep hill or down a steep hill. And so what becomes critical is uh, because of how significant some of the slopes are in your community is keeping that parking very close to the street so that you're not building either a large platform out over um, a hill or digging into a hill to meet you know, a, a setback. So where slopes exceed 20% on a site, we're basically allowing cars to inhabit the front setback, uh, 20 foot or 15 foot setback. And, but the provision that we have is that they can't be covered so that it's an uncovered parking space in that, 20, in, in that 15 foot setback. Once it's beyond that 15 foot setback, it can be covered, but we didn't want garages to come right out to the street. Is essentially what we're trying to avoid. Um, next slide, David. Oh, actually, sorry, go back one more thing. Hey, Kevin, this is where height and um, we took a, I think a, it's a fairly time tested um, uh, technique of basically uh, you, you set your height limit by measuring where the, the building uh, hits the grade and then your height goes up from that point and then it slopes with the site slope across. And uh, you, in cases where you have, um, you know, the building wipes out some of that slope, you draw an imaginary line from the high to the low, uh, which is shown on the lower diagram there, um, and, and measure from that, from that point going across. And it requires a, an architect to basically step the building as it's going down the slope. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was our thought. Interestingly, most of your multifamily sites uh, are fairly are fairly flat. Uh, it's the T three uh, and T four SN, uh, which is the townhouse, and and those are the more flexible um, uh, project types too, as well um, to work with these slope requirements. But that's that's the system that we're as a first pass, you know, running by you for for your input. Great, thank you, Ryan. So um, I'm gonna try to go through the, the remainder of the slides pretty quickly here, but um, you know, one of the things that we had heard from you is that you know, the style chapter was not a great solution and, and we didn't uh, particularly care for it because it, it kind of, it, it basically meant that developers would come to you with one of those prescribed styles and it wouldn't necessarily be done that well. Um, so the focus for us on this chapter is trying to uh, maintain a human scale with materials um, quality design, high level craftsmanship, um, and trying to, to, to dictate how materials are used. So, you know, using a fine grain module and texture on the ground floor facade. So when you're in a pedestrian district, you, you have, you can touch good materials and they're at a scale, uh, that the pedestrian experience is, 
Um, when you get materials like that, they need to wrap around the corner. They can't be like face brick that kind of just butts up at the corner and doesn't look like an actual full brick uh, equivalency. Um, we shouldn't have a change of materials on outer corners because that looks fake and it doesn't work out well. Um, so these are the types of things in terms of providing um, variety and color, but just doing a higher quality presentation uh, of the materials overall. So the way that we have put it uh, in the odds is we've we provided a number of different ways or types of materials that could be used. I think one of the big challenges that we run into the materials list is we do have to put materials in here that will work for affordable housing. Um, you know, they're not going to be able to go with the stone in large part. They might have to go with a vinyl siding or something like that. So that's one of the, I think, the challenges with all of this is trying to provide a wide enough breadth of allowance um, that a good developer um, can do great things with, but will allow, uh, you know, an affordable housing project to to move forward. So parking, um, parking is always a big deal. We discussed this in our last meeting. Um, you know, this is the current standards uh, for the city of Larkspur's parking. Um, the guest parking uh, is always one of the things that is really challenging with this. And one of the things that we had been told in our last meeting was that the city of Larkspur had a project, which is Tam Ridge, that had been studied in terms of its parking. So what we did was we looked at Tam Ridge, we looked at what the existing Larkspur uh, requirements were, and then we kind of tweaked it to, to work with that. And so this is a slide that, you know, we'll probably have to come back to uh, when we start our conversation. But the idea here is, you know, kind of understanding that in the, in the current parking code for the city of Larkspur, um, there is an additional parking requirement for condos over rentals. Um, and that the existing guest parking requirement um, essentially is, you know, four for the first five units and then one for every five thereafter. So that really does add up. What Tam Ridge had done uh, was one space for every 10 units for guest parking, and it had stuck with a, a generally more modest um, number of spaces with the exception of the two-bedroom condo. Um, it had done a two, uh, I'm sorry, it, you know, it, it stuck with it. So um, we want to go with a 1.5 for that using the rental and not the condo number that Tam Ridge used. Uh, and we left for the T4SN and the, T, the T3, which are a little more suburban in nature. Um, we allowed for that one and a half space per unit um, for the rental and the condo. And once you get into the denser areas, it's one per unit. And now keep in mind, these are minimums. Um, you know, there isn't a maximum in place. Um, that is something that I think is worth discussion, um, whether a maximum should be put in place. Um, but this is this is sort of where we were trying to massage the numbers to to get to a point based on Tam Ridge that we thought would be workable um, for the city. But we certainly are going to be looking for your feedback on that. Um, and then Ryan worked out this, which is looking at that lucky site and trying to understand, OK, well, if we use the current parking numbers for the city of Larkspur in scenario one, because of the space that parking takes up, um, you end up with only about 14 units, um, you know, and then you have 28 unit spaces and, and guest spaces. And we he kind of game played out these different scenarios um, down to scenario three, which is actually uh, more stringent, only a half space minimum um, with one guest space for every 10 allows you the most units. So it really does show the inflection point of how important parking can be in terms of the the prospect of actually seeing housing built, you know, it's, right. yeah, I mean, I think all of you got, there's, we have no guests. Everyone here knows that the parking is the driving, uh, the driving force. And then finally, last slide, um, there is a large sites chapter and this chapter is roughly what was provided in the odds. But I think, you know, we've been in discussion that chapter three provides um, the, the, the parcel size limits um, that would dictate the requirement for roads and other things. So we're not sure if we really need the chapter six. Um, it would spell out a little more about how civic and spaces were located uh, and, and how buildings would fit on it. But I, I think in general, all of that would end up referring back to chapter three anyway. Um, so okay. that, that's- That sounds sensible actually. The, I think, you know, you've got the cost plus site, you've got the sewer site. Um, you know, you've got the lucky site. There are a few large sites that those would fall under, um, but I, I don't think it's necessary to have a chapter to control those. No. So that's our presentation. Sorry, it's a little longer than we had expected, but we would love to 
hear what you think uh, about the approach and happy to go back to any slide uh, for discussion. No, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, hey, I had a couple questions. Um, by the way, yeah, this was really, I think, also continuous with, um, you know, I was looking back at our notes, you know, some of the earlier meetings we had. Um, one is just costs. Have you run like a cost calculator, you know, as you went through different ways of, you know, even looking at the spacing between buildings and setbacks and all that, is there something that just gives us some sense of what, you know, what this may cost to a developer? Because I know parking, you know, just off the top is about 30 to 40,000 per parking spot. So, you know, as we make these policy decisions, I'm just curious, you know, what the, you know, incentivization or optimization is for someone trying to develop. Before I punt this over to Ryan, I will say that, um, the, as you mentioned, the parking is a significant um, is a significant factor. And yes, parking spaces, if they're structured above ground, are like thirty five thousand dollars a space. Um, one of the things is, you know, at some of the lower levels, at some of the the, the T threes and T four, the smaller ones that are allowing two and a half to three floors, um, that the, that's really only realistically developable as townhomes. Um, you're not going to see someone doing flats over retail. It just doesn't pencil. Um, you really need to get more verticality to actually make that work from a developer standpoint. Ryan, what would you like to add? Uh, so if you go back to that slide that had the different um, scenarios, I mean, what's kind of telling about this is that the scenario one disincentivizes smaller units that might be attractive to young people or folks looking to downsize. Uh, if you look at scenario two, a 1300 square foot average unit, uh, you know, is, is a large two bedroom or three bedroom. Uh, and then you get into scenario three where uh, you take those parking spaces down to 0.5. That's where you start to see a mix of studios, ones and small twos, which uh, 640 foot average gets you that kind of blend. So it kind of becomes a question of what product type do you wanna see in your community? Uh, and the parking, uh, the, the space that goes into a parking requirement, uh, you know, is a huge part of the cost. Now, just to be totally uh, clear, we don't have a, a, a someone running pr a, a prototypical performance on our, our prototypes, which is something that we have done in other communities where we'll have a, a economics consultant come on, look at cost of construction, look at land acquisition, and try and come up with what are the feasible developer performa. Uh, part of it, I think, is these standards will be in place for quite a long time and the market constantly changes. So it's a okay. little hard to always be in control of that. But I think the general rule is if you want to see smaller units, you lower the parking requirement. Uh, and that, that becomes one of the major incentives um, to seeing uh, smaller unit production. Right. That just pushes the parking off onto city streets. It does. Yeah. It also encourages, uh, you know, folks to use alternate forms of transit uh, or walk. And so you have to be really careful about where you locate those sites. Clearly, um, single family home neighborhoods, this is not realistic. But in the Marin Country Mart, where there is, uh, you know, some commercial activity they could walk to, there's public transit there. It is more feasible than others. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we'd all have cars. But yeah, no, the barrier costs are so significant. Actually, in an ideal world, we've had less cars. But yes, <laughs> but the but, reality is, you're not the 0.5 space per unit. Uh, is is what Kevin said is going to push the cars in onto yes. city property. That's right. all there is to it. Right, and, and it is, and that Rock. and that's 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 that can be problematic. And just as a as a footnote, because I know we're putting a lot of emphasis on Larkspur Landing and the opportunities that exist there, and they do exist there. Um, and you know, there's the access to transit, and there's access to shopping, to some extent. But keep in mind, that's a very high end. Um, yes. that, that shopping center is very high end shopping center. There's, there's no, there's no sh grocery store there. Right. There are, there are, there are nothing, uh, there's no gas station there. There are no, there are no, uh, amenities that, um, 
people would need to have access to to make that a, a, a tr attractive. So I, I understand the impulse to to assume that that's going to be utilized for a lot of housing development, but it, it really can't be unless the amenities uh, match the housing stock over there. And and I and I think in particular of grocery stores, why would anyone want to live over in that area if they, without a car? Yeah. Um, in the absence of a grocery store, I mean, it's just I don't I don't see how they could do it. I, I actually, um, to further that point, I was wondering if, um, you know, Elise, you sent the article about the Cinemark, right? That you know that opened up, and I don't know if that was up for discussion, but I would find, you know, um, it would be very helpful if we took your presentation, David and Ryan, and maybe applied it to two use cases. So I was thinking about, you know, if I have the numbers right, you know, T five CMS. I think is where the Cinemark would go. And I, you know, I printed that all out and really tried to walk through, you know, visualize uh, what exactly that might look like, you know, so if we built it the Cinemark and then the other is maybe North Magnolia, which I believe is T4 CMS. So, so, you know, I think that those are very real and things we can visualize. And some of these issues of parking and height and you know the width of 120 feet, and you know different masking and quality arguments. I, I don't know if the, if the group wants to do this, but I kind of walked in, you know, with two thoughts. One is like, you know, what's the best feedback we can give you, and two is how can we really apply, you know, a 167-page document, you know, to our everyday thinking. And you know, what crossed my mind was, you know, two sites which are very likely going to have development. You know, I don't know if it's going to be the Cinemark, but I know there's going to be something built up there if we're going to get yep. 979 and North Magnolia is the other one. I don't think it's going to be downtown Larkspur. We may get a little here or there. So, you know, I would skip over that. And, you know, the regular R1, I think that's important not to intrude on, you know, the small neighborhood feels. But I don't know if the rest of you are amenable to that, but I, I thought that would be a very helpful exercise just to, you know, to kind of run through a use case or two. And we did that a little bit, Gabe, in the document. There is uh, there are three examples, uh, or I think four examples, where uh, in T three uh, we I you know scoured your your areas for a uh, example of a. Actually, David, do you have the PDF that you I was just pull pulling up? the PDF up? So I found I found a residential lot that had the rear half of it was undeveloped, and. Um, and so I did, I said, okay, let's take these rules and see if they actually work on this site. And uh, I laid out basically a, um, uh, you know, the, the secondary massing in the back uh, using the rules. Uh, let's see, let me. Is this the one you're thinking of? Yeah, so yeah. The, this one says, okay, what would we get if we followed the rules and we found a site where this was possible? So there was a really nice older home in the front and then the backyard, which was undeveloped, um, uh, we added this accessory structure and uh, followed, followed the rules that we could. And you ended up with a nice, uh, essentially a very, very, very small two bedroom or a nice one bedroom um, auxiliary home. And so we did that example here. And then if you go to the, the next, um, we did not test the Cinemark site or the North Magnolia site, though. Um, this is a, a site where there's an existing townhome development. When I looked at your parcel map, I was um, not sure why they didn't build the top corner of it. So there might be a, a reason that, that makes it impossible. But I said, OK, well, let's say if this, uh, you know, this site gets infilled and a lot of these standards are relating to infill. Um, how would we lay out townhomes per our rules? So this was an example of how this uh, layout of townhomes met the criteria that are in your um, draft odds. Um, and then uh, if you go to the next one, David, this was, uh, if you go back one, this was basically imagining that the Luckies took an urban grocer form where basically you have that site slopes down. So you would set the store up at the Magnolia elevation and then slope the street down to tie into parking underneath it. Um, and then you would put apartments above the retail component. And then off the back, you would have apartments that would start at grade and climb up. And so um, 
and this is where we tested the scenario for oh, what kind, how many units does this yield, uh, et cetera. So what you'll see on this example, though, is we had to add an interior frontage line um, and we had to add, uh, you know, basically break it up into four small sites. One provision that we have uh, in the document is that parking may span across uh, the sites. So you're parking and you can connect interior building circulation as well across a design site line, as long as it's not a legal parcel line. Um, so that when you do have, for security reasons, you need to have a controlled entry, like in an apartment building, um, you know, that you're you're doing something realistic. But the idea is that the primary building massing has to be broken along these interior uh, frontage lines. Um, and we've evolved this a little bit since our last draft, uh, refined it a little bit. So uh, we have- Just curious- um this site is actually made up of three sites. Would it be precluded from being consolidated? No, and that's where I added the uh, specific, since it's east of the railroad right oh, away, okay. it's exempt. And because I, uh, okay. I discovered that, I was like, oh man, these parcels are bigger than, you know, some, they're actually, there's only one parcel that's bigger than half an acre. So it, that initial provision wasn't enough. And so that's where I thought, you know, the really precious stuff in the downtown is all on the west side of that rail or railroad line. And it was the um, the east side that could, I think, afford to to take on a, a bigger project. But in, in any case, uh, it, it's really hard to redevelop a grocery store site um, because you're tearing something down and you're getting a relatively low yield back um, that it isn't usually until that business is out of business completely and there's no prospect for a new tenant that retail comes down. But I think that location is probably a pretty successful um, uh, retail location because of it's, it's, so, it's so unique having a parking lot. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> but, but we felt this was important to test the rules to make sure that the rules we're writing actually could work. And then um, can you explain how the, the unit counts work? So um, so one concern that, or one thing that, that all, I guess all planners in California are facing right now that the applicants are entitled to do the maximum amount of density that, that we're um, allowing in the general plan or the housing element. Um, and that's when they start asking to waive the rules is when they can't get this building form in the, in the, um, get the units they want with the building forms that we're allowing. So I'm wondering, have you done any testing to make sure that the that we have enough density or is it just a matter of they just keep adding stories if they need need more? Uh, so, that. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's interesting. We did a large project out in um, Dublin out, out on the 580. And uh, what we found there was developers uh, wanted uh, townhomes and single family detached, but very close together, um, <clears throat> rather than apartment buildings, because the economics and the um, cost per square foot on those was really, really different than doing uh, uh, an apartment building. So it's um, it's really hard to answer that question. And I, I think what you'll find is that it's the parking that plays into what your unit size is. Uh, these sites generally in Larkspur are pretty small. And when you have to um, build a lot of parking, you have to have a really efficient and uh, large number of units to offset that parking cost. So on these really small sites, um, I don't think you're gonna see big buildings because they won't wanna build a lot of parking. But they could ask right. for a waiver from the parking and just build the building. Well, you know, there, there's a couple of obviously remedies that they, they can take. And, you know, we've tried to get legal direction on, on you know, what, what the hierarchy is of all of this. And someone, you know, a developer could come in and use the state density bonus and exceed the odds. And it's our understanding that would that, that density bonus would supersede the odds. That sounds um, right. It's not, it's not clear, though, whether then they would have to kick into 
discretionary review or not because they wouldn't comply with the odds and they, yeah they wouldn't need to so one of the things that we've been advising um, uh, other cities is you know to 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 increase the height and the odds to have more control over the development you know um, if it is if the state density bonus will be used over the top of it maybe you at least put nods in place that has more height than you might be comfortable with i think that's you know one of the things to to kind of think about why would and, we do that why would we do that the, because the, be the disincentives for using the state rules is you have to have the union labor it's expensive and there's a, a review process <clears throat> more time than if you have an efficient set of odds that give the developer enough for them to to break ground and get a project built then they'll be the uh, then that becomes a, a better path for them than going through the um oh i understand uh, it becomes process. a better i understand it becomes a better path for them but i don't know if it's a better path for us as a city that's what i'm wrestling if i may with. add just to be clear that there would be a distinction between what would be allowed through odds and then what that density bonus height would be so there would be a distinction between the two it's not that you would just be allowing that additional height outright. It's more about a security in case in the event that a density bonus would come to pass, you right. would have these objective standards in place for that possibility. Well put. Yeah, that's correct. Oh, okay. I guess yeah, I, was, I, I guess I was getting excited there because it sounded like we were creating an opportunity for design review in that in that set of circumstances, but maybe not. There are some state, you know, some of the state laws, and and as Elise mentioned, you know, waiving um, parking requirements um, that the odds cannot affect. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of overlapping pieces that work with this. I, I understand. It's very complicated. Yeah. Which is an unfortunate aspect of it. And then, um, is that the limit to the? Is that the limit to the design? Is just the sort of the footprint? Well, there's a footprint. There's a, there's the materiality. You know, I mean, there's all the the form based code that is the setbacks and like basically with the scale of the buildings. Um, and then you have to come back and you have to use the appropriate materiality on it. Um, and the massing, you know, Ryan in chapter three has included massing in terms of wings versus the body. So there's like a breakdown of scale and articulation. Um, so, I, you know, there's there's quite a bit. It's really designed to work with what is in Larkspur currently and try to to work with your current build form. Is it, but no, there's no requirement for step bins or, I mean, so if you, if one was to come in and do literally like a box, that would be okay. So if the box didn't exceed certain dimensions. So if <clears throat> you can have a maximum building length, but like say for instance on the T5, um, the, the 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 biggest one, there's a, a four foot. I think you can have up to 120 feet length of facade before you have to have a four foot adjustment minimum in plane. That can be. Um, a, a minimum of 20 feet it can be longer, but it needs to be a minimum of 20 feet. And so, you know, David and I looked around, there's, um, there's some really great architecture firms uh, in the Bay Area. So we spent time looking at Piatox website and some other folks that do lots of multifamily housing at that scale. And the ones where it was super busy, it looked kind of gimmicky and, you know, it's not going to age well. Um, Piatox does a lot of architecture where, the buildings actually have a relatively straightforward form. Um, they're not over articulated or over baked. Um, and so we adopted some of the controls that we saw in their architecture to um, to really guide uh, the, the highest density one. Um, on the lower ones, the massing, you know, if your building mass is limited to 60 or 70 feet wide, um, I think we didn't want to micromanage the articulation of something that's already pretty small. So, well, I'm also also want to add that we do still have the frontage types in here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the frontage types, which you know, go through, you know, the okay. the porch. Oh, okay, the door that's, yard. that's more what I was asking yeah. about. That okay. that that frontage type still exists in these odds, and okay. it's you know the 
the type of frontage can be designed in a lot of different ways. You can design a stoop in so many different ways. Um, you know, so we're not dictating how that's designed. We're just saying, you know, you should employ one of these frontage types, um, you know, uh, in the design that faces the street. So, so I think that, that, that kind of answers that, that question. I know Brock has to leave, but I'm curious to know what Brock thinks about them. Um, well, it's uh, you know I'm I'm hearing it, but I'm I'm having difficulty picturing exactly what the end product is, um, and maybe more examples of of buildings that actually meet the the standards of what you're talking about would be helpful for me. Um, just to see what what it what it uh, entails and and what the final product uh, might be and you know Larkspur is a, a pretty unique town and um, you know I I realize we have uh, this obligation but uh, I also um, concerned that it it changes the character to a point where it's not not the same anymore and and it will to some degree. So uh, I need to go through that 400 pages or 160 pages or whatever and see if I can uh, see what see what's being proposed really. But I share that comment, Brock. I, it, it is hard based upon like the presentation we had tonight. It's really hard to translate those concepts into a visualization of what things would look like in, in our community. Um, just because that's, 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 that's just the nature of it. Yeah. it. It is the nature. And I think part of the objective design guidelines is, is allowing the architecture of the area to flourish and still exist. And I think the way that the odds was originally written, it basically would have overwritten what Larkspur was. And you would have ended up with a lot of, you know, tutor, style, tutor and things that just yeah. don't work at all. And yeah, Larkspur, a, lot of, a lot of junk. And that's, yeah, I think that's yeah. what, Brock and I and maybe others are, are kind of struggling with right because um, it's it's hard it's hard to come up with these kinds of standards in a way that fits the unique characteristics of a community it's just hard to do that and uh, and I think we all appreciate that but we got to try because an, this, this is a this is a this this could be uh, this could result in a major transformation of the character of our community which I think would be opposed universally. Kevin, I, I wonder if uh, this conversation just triggered a thought, and it's not in our odds at all. Um, and Andy, please let me know if it's not allowed legally, <laughs> roughly. But we could add some provisions that basically said an applicant needs to demonstrate a knowledge of the context by mapping the buildings that are, you know, within X feet of their project, and then they need Ooh, to like that uh, idea. They need to address how their particular building um, uh, uh, introduces scale elements that are similar. Um, or I, I haven't thought this through, but yeah, takes, you, takes, you're, in, you're, takes you're, influence. You're, you're getting subjective. I think that. But, yeah, that's I mean, like, of, but if, I think it, there's something that might be objective yeah. in there if you. Yeah, and it might be something where we could demonstrate it with an example, like I, you know, but here's I think, yeah. I think Here, that's exactly what the case was in um, San, not San Jose, Santa Clara. I think it was over something almost very similar to that. Yeah, it's <laughs> we've done a we've done plenty of projects where our entitlements process requires document what the surrounding buildings are around your project. Um, we could do something like pick, you know, um, identify three different materials that are predominantly used in this district. And and incorporate at least one of those into your project in a significant way. Right. You know, maybe there's. I, I, this is just off the fly, but I'm just thinking maybe our last chapter, or maybe it's in your materialities chapter. Yep. There's a con, a context provision that talks about you know here's identifying um, you know some contextual elements and then incorporating them into your project. Um, what's interesting is the different parts of your city that were developed in different eras have really different feel. Oh, yeah. And some of those you may embrace, and some of those you may not. So it's, yeah. it's well, that a goes back to my point. You know, we've we've got some old architecture lying around the city that's 
kind of junky and um you know i would i wouldn't want to have somebody proposing a, a, a structure in an area where we've got really bad architecture and then saying well this is going to fit right in there might be a sensitivity boundary like we identify an area that is of particular sensitivity on the map and say within there you must follow x provisions and in the other areas maybe you maybe instead you just encourage modern uh, or you know contemporary architecture over um uh emulating some of the product from the 80s yeah. or things that might not be as I, I i i really like the 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 initial statement of the concept except it will be tricky to put into place yeah well, I, I do think that, you know, one of the things that, you know, makes a place a place uh, that the housing is is more, in my opinion, about the scale and the setback and, and the density and the height. Like you drive along a street, you don't necessarily look at the style that much. It really is. How, what's the overall feel? You know, like how big are the houses? How, how far are the houses from the street? How much are they separated by? And we, we can control all of those things here. And then the next layer is what's the materiality? Is it? Is it really a junky material like, you know, EFIS that no one wants to see, or is it a better level of material? So, you know, the, the style actually is kind of like a tertiary thing. I think so much of it has to do with the streetscape and the landscape and how far buildings are set back that really make the place the place. And the design of the car, how, how the car interfaces. Because right. a lot of the less desirable architecture uh, in your community, again, subjective, uh, in my opinion, is where the upper level, where the where the people place is all off the street, and then the cars are just exposed at the ground, yeah. and there it's a nonstop thing. And so, yep. if, in the odds that we've set up, we've limited the width of a garage. We've limited, you know, if you've got a flat site, then you need to park the car in the back, things like that. So, yeah, um, so that the frontage is more focused on uh, a pedestrian environment, and we. We found on Madrone some really nice examples of more level sites where you could, um, you know, we basically said, here's a picture of a house in Larkspur that did this well. The driveway was almost right on the property line, um, the side yard line. And then they, the you know, they basically maximized as much frontage for the facade, the entry, the windows, the charming little house, and the nice front yard. And that was... Um, the architecture wasn't great, but it was a nice feel. So, our architecture does count. <laughs> I, it I, does. I, I understand <laughs> the point, David, you were making about you know the neighborhood and the characteristics of that. But you know, you can have a nice neighborhood, and you can come across a really piece of crap, crappy piece <laughs> of architecture, and it, it just ruins everything. So, um, I think we need to bear that in mind as well. Yeah, you're talking to two architects here too, so we're we're trying to take so our architect I'm not, hat. I, I'm I do not, agree I'm not, with you. I'm, I'm, not yeah, I'm, not, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I, I I agree with you. That certainly can happen. I I think what's I find fascinating and ironic is that, you know, I've I've done quite a few projects in Larkspur and other places, and almost universally, it started with higher density and got whittled down. Uh, it, it was just the way things were done. And on sites that certainly could have handled more units. And, and here we are sort of being, um, you know, going, having going to the, ram down yeah. our throats, as it were. Um, yeah. We're going in the reverse. Yeah, an objective, objective in whose opinion, I guess, is the, um, you know, er everything to me is somewhat subjective, but anyway uh, they want it to be quantifiable yes. essentially right got it. <laughs> well but you know a, a standard that says you do have to take into account you know if it's phrased properly you know you have to take into account the characteristics of the immediate neighborhood i mean it, i think that i think that can be done but it has to it is tricky and it has to be done in a way that doesn't undermine the legality of what we're trying to do because we don't want to get sued well i'm right. i'm also also concerned that objective could be underspecified you know, so so David, mm -hmm. your point, you know, what really counts is massing setback, you know, kind of like, you know, if you took off your glasses and had bad vision, you know, that's really right. all you see. And right. and I don't know if true. I mean, you're architects, you know better, but but I, I think that, you know, the the risk we run is, you know, we can't, you know, overspecify something, but are we underspecifying it? You know, so while mm -hmm. your exercise is 
here is an area you mentioned the luckies you know urbanization or the south alicia project you know let me go through and see what it might look like that that isn't very satisfying to me because i'm curious where someone who wants to cut corners could still follow the rules and you know you've you've run a nice median or you know sort of best practice approach and you know i, I just want to ensure that we're protecting the community with our you know not by under specifying um and brock I, i'm wondering you know we, we kind of strayed from your original question i know you have to leave you know i i thought you were asking the same thing i was and you know i i didn't you know you guys said look we've done some examples but like i'm on page 69 of the ods right now and i see this five unit building. So basically the Cinemark could be a five unit building with a density bonus. And it's this brick thing, which looks like a building I lived in in Berkeley on Telegraph. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, or actually Brock, are you asking the same thing? Could we visualize, could we have David and Ryan run through North Magnolia, you know, just, just run through the areas where we really see likely development and, and maybe your tests would be, you know, to find loopholes or to see where a developer might land, you know, in the absence of economic and cost calculations. I think what we're really trying to ensure is that our policy is, is striking that golden, you know, balance that, you know, we do get to our 979 and we also don't turn into wind cut times three. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we know from so Brock, experience question. that- it... Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Actually, strangely enough, I, I think Wincup, uh, you know, I know there was a lot of resistance to that particular building, but um, I, I think it works pretty well. So uh, and that's not to say I would like to see it along Magnolia, but, um, uh, you know, there's, that's what's difficult about this is that, really until you see a proposal or see what somebody else is, is looks at these and comes up with it's, it's really kind of hard to know where it takes us and uh and i don't want to find out it's taken us to a place that we we can't we have essentially no say in um you know I, i'm on the planning commission and what do you need the planning commission for really you know, it's, uh, there's no design review. Um, Just a rubber stamp. Yeah. It is, it is ministerial. That is, that is the way that it is written. So yeah, yeah basically it could be reviewed by someone but, but in the building. Right, where we're changing chapter 17 of the zoning code for multifamily. If, if I want to do something to my home, you still, do, you still have to go through design review. Right. This is for a single family home. This does not apply. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's clear, Brock. I mean, the planning commission is not doing ministerial review for everything. You know, sorry, my son's in the background, but, but I think we're really focused on multifamily. That's yes. right. No, right. That, 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 that's, that, that's true. But it, 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 it does. It, it's, it's a change in the role of the planning commission. It just is. Definitely. And I, so, and so I, do, I, don't know I, I do think it's funny that Brock. you guys are still referring to that property over in Court Madeira as Wind Cup. I haven't actually had that heard that I term. term used in a while. <laughs> We've just been here too long. <laughs> I, know, I know exactly what you're talking about when you call it that. <laughs> I do. I do too. But I just I haven't had heard people use Bell. that. Bell is it Bell now? Bell. Yeah. Something, it's, I don't know. They keep changing. They keep changing the name. I don't know whether that's a change in ownership or what. What it is, but it's gone yeah. through three or four different names since it used to be Wind Cup. You know what, that also might be interesting is to see how it would apply to a site like that. So that that built maybe portions of that frontage would be allowed, but they would have had to been broken up. Maybe the rear side yeah. that's facing the freeway wouldn't have worked at all. Yeah. Or it's, would have had to be broken up. Um, that might be a good example too, is to look at something that exists and say, no, this would have worked or this wouldn't have worked. There are some very large developments up there. That, we, that that property only works because it's sitting right next to the freeway. I'm, I'm it, sorry to say. It fits with an architectural style which we always refer to as neo neo brutalistic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well said. Um, I I've got to go. <laughs> yeah, you do. All right. Thank we, you for hanging in. Yeah. Um, Thank you. When is our next meeting? Uh, oh, so we do have a meeting scheduled for next Thursday, the seventeenth, and yeah, that would be. I saw that. Um, 
the intent is to get the draft housing element out on Monday for a 30 day review period. And so um, it's gonna be a long, really long document to read and we don't expect you to have to read it by Thursday. <coughs> what, what we're intending to do is just have that be a meeting where we can introduce the housing element to you. And then, um, to, or go ahead, Andy, you can talk more about that. Oh, I, I if, um, as far as things that we would, want you to focus on is our assumptions for sites at, with this draft and keeping in mind this is the public draft it's not the hcd draft that'll be the next round so at the end of this 30-day public review when we'll be um accumulating comments from everyone including you and then collating those and integrating those into the document that we'll be sending off to hcd our goal is to get a, a ready to certify letter in our first round with HCD and uh good luck with, good, good luck with, with that but... with Elise on our team I believe it's possible and yeah. so, so we're I'll very be excited that 30 days to look at it like HCD would because I I just want to make sure that we take get everything in there that they might be asking for and then um and then at the same time we could ask the city council and planning commissioners to individually look at the document and give us comments with anything that they think should, should we should work on more before it the next draft comes out. So just a, as a just a, a, a procedural issue. So the the thirty day period would be triggered when the fourteenth, November fourteenth, Monday. Okay, so Monday. So um, and we and we just have a um, a committee meeting set for next Thursday. Will there be any public meetings, any public hearings where the public more generally will be invited to participate? Because as you can see from for these meetings, public input has been scarce which is, right. is amazing to me that there's no public interest it's it's or, or you know well, i think people owner. may just don't, don't really understand what we're what we're what we're doing but i think once once this draft comes out um it's going to raise some eyebrows and caught, catch catch the attention of certainly i think some, we had looked people. at having a steering committee meeting on december 8th to talk about it as a public meeting so that will have given everyone a chance to read it and the public yeah. and then we could get comments from the public on that draft at that meeting okay um, well, that's, that's 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 that's, that's kind of what my I'm calendar at. that's okay. kind of what i'm looking for i think it's and important then, to have a general more general public you know a meeting that's advertised as a public meeting to consider the draft document as opposed to these meetings which where we're, we're talking about concept and issues and the evolution of the document but once that thing goes out um the the yes is going to hit the fan and we need to make sure that yeah. you know, we we have we have adequate outreach to the public so that we don't get caught looking dumb later on you've got to go brock and and i i will as elise knows i, I won't be here for the december 8th meeting um Oh. Uh, and but I'm so not... you can send us please, please just send us your comments or send me any comments that you have after you take a look at the draft okay Thank you. Yeah, Thank great. You. Thanks, Brock. Thank have a nice time, Brock. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Um, so let's see. Is that. Um... And at least maybe we could do another postcard campaign. Get oh, that, that would be a good out. idea. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. Yeah, because okay. this is, we want people, We this is a good time for people to give us their comments, either that we missed something, they want to see a policy that the site that, um, Comments on sites, although the comments on site, we would we can listen to all the comments. We're just really looking for things that are realistically yeah, right. potentially developed in the next eight years. But getting a document out like that with a with a with the time frame that we're in, this is this is a this is a categorically distinct part of the process, and it really does require a a, a distinct approach to public involvement. I believe. Um, beyond what we've been doing for these for these meetings. I mean, this is fine. The door is wide mm -hmm. open to the public. Anybody wants to come in, they can say whatever they want to say to the extent that they're they've educated themselves. But when when confronted with a a, a plan, a, dra a draft plan um, that could guide what their community is going to look like, we're going to get people coming out of the woodwork. Yeah, so let's let's. I think that's a good idea. So let's plan on a significant public outreach for December eighth to. If so, if people want to comment online, there's going to be, that's what Andy will go over at the next meeting too, is how the public can comment on this document, because there's a website that you can enter in your own comments, and then um, and then have a meeting where if people want to comment in person and make a verbal comment, they can. 
Yeah. And of course, we, people can also email their comments. So, so we make sure that there's multiple ways, whatever is, is at yeah. their comfort level. And we'll also make a, a clear connection between what we're doing with the housing element and this odds approach. So um, I'll be getting this presentation from David and Ryan. We'll make sure that it's linked in with our uh, discussion about sites so that people can go back and forth if they want to know, well, but what will these sites look like or what, how will the development standards change? So they can also make comments about the, the yeah. odds if, if they want. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think if, we, if we're going to we're going to do a meeting where the pu public more generally is invited to comment on a document as opposed to right. comment on the evolution of the document, which is right what so far. This will be more concrete. This will be more concrete, and I think we yes. ought to do it in City Hall, and we ought to advertise it that way. And okay. you guys ought to be prepared to, you know, make a make a presentation um, that would be digestible by folks who would show up in person. Okay, you'd like you'd like me to be there in person. I can't oh, I, be. No, I. I mean, I'm not. You can I'm not, be on Zoom too. We can yeah, have it yeah, set up for yeah, technology. No, no, yeah, okay. that's that, that's fine. And, and you guys don't have to be there in person. But I'm, I, all I'm saying is that I, I think for this sort of thing, um, I think we should prepare. Be prepared. People can disagree with me if they want, but we should be prepared to do this kind of like a city council right. meeting. You know, that would be, like, I mean, it'd be great to have that conversation during this 30 day period and then not yeah. when it returns. So that yeah. would be really nice. I, yeah. I think that's I really, agree. I think it's really important to kind of head, head things off at the pass. Okay. And it, a couple, oh, it'll couple return of, to, a, yeah, go ahead. It'll be, it'll return yeah. to another public hearing, but I mean, to get the comments out. No, now no I, like, I understand that, but the, the sooner the better. Yeah, a couple more thoughts. Um, Elise, I'm wondering, uh, you know, how we report out on this, you know, I, I'm assuming, mm -hmm that the next city council meeting, or I mean, before December 8th, you know, if they're gonna do a presentation and then, uh, you know, David and Ryan, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I didn't read the whole document, so I didn't catch the Lucky's, you know, urban urban design or the South Elysio, but is there a way to create like an executive summary or a summary sheet? Like even, you know, some of the key things we've talked about parking, mm -hmm. you know, height, um, width was a great discussion, permeability, massing materials, just those things, even if it were in a tabular form, like, hey, you know, what I, what I printed out from this document that I found incredibly useful was the map, like here's your zone, yep. you know, a really clear explanation that this is not your single family residence, we're talking about big ones, you know, so it's likely to be Larkspur Landing, North Magnolia, et cetera. And, you know, here's a table of, you know, you know, because we can't anticipate every, you know, architectural design or, you know, creative, you know, uh, you know, product. But but we can say this is basically we could have five stories where Cinemark is, you know, we would try to make things the width of like four bungalows, you know, we do 30 times four, you know, we look for permeability, we're going to do one parking spot, because quite honestly, I wouldn't if I were a member of the public, I wouldn't join this meeting. This is way the hell too technical. And, and, you know, it's like, you know, like people say, show me the baby. You know, I, I don't want to be in the labor room, you know, just show me the baby. So <laughs> can show the baby for, for the meeting, we will get more engagement. I think we should do the outreach. But, but I, I mean, I love this technical, you know, this level of detail. But I think part of our job as elected and as, you know, representatives is to make it digestible. And, you know, Andy, you've done a great job in the website. But you know, I actually took your stuff, printed it out and went, and, you know, met with people and walked around. It wasn't easy. And, and I think mm. that, that, you know, to, to the extent to which we can make this digestible and show them the baby, I think, I think we're going to get more engagement. Because you're right, Kevin. I mean, people will not really care until they don't get what they didn't ask for. They get what they didn't want. And they don't even know right now. Right. Okay, we're in agreement. So... Well, let's right. let's let's do all those things and get it all set up so that we can have that level of public engagement during this 30 day period. And then um, reporting out at the city council meeting on the 16th that the housing draft housing element is out would would be very helpful, I think, just to get that word out. Yeah, all the time. right. And, and, and if people have questions. That? Um, no, but if you if you had a report from this committee to say, or I guess you won't have that to report or I don't someone think to report, a... the city manager could report that I could have yeah. him report that. Yeah. I don't, I don't, okay. I don't, I don't think we need a report. I don't think we need to do more than that, quite honestly. Yeah. Okay. But Dan knows to put this on the agenda. I'll, or not to put it on the agenda, but if he can announce it in his report that it's out for yeah. people to look at, that would be helpful. City, city manager's report. Right. Right. And okay. do we anticipate wanting to hear back um, from uh, David and Ryan for odds in December, or do you, do we want to push that out to January? I, my preference would be let's focus on the housing element until January. Um, but maybe we can develop some examples in the meantime. 
maybe we can talk with our visualization partner if that's still available. Oh, yeah, David. that's right. That's a possibility as well. Yeah. But that's, I think it just it would be nice to get the, have the next two meetings be just on the housing element. Yeah, that's, that's sounds right. Andy, uh, David, if we do a further site testing, uh, you have a better idea than I do what uh, Gabe and Kevin and Brock are speaking to you, like the wing cup site or things like that. Uh, <laughs> I, can, um, I can meet can with you, you and cir yeah. circle them on a map. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd, be happy to, I'd be happy to give you a personal tour if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, we, we love, we do all our shopping in Corte Madera or Larkspur, you know, like, of we we, we live next to Richmond, so we're not going to shop there. Yeah. And I think <laughs> looking at the housing element sites might be really useful um, because those are the ones we're hoping will develop. So having examples yeah, for that, that might be that's a, good. That's a, that's an that's a excellent point. Yeah, I like that. And by and the way, guys, I just want to thank you, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan and David. I, I think the, you know, like you said, the edits you did, you know, Making it more form based, taking out sections. I mean, I I don't want to you know um, gloss over the the level of um, you know kind of uh, improvement you know uh, over the previous odds. I mean, 167 pages, but before it was it was really gruesome. So I, I feel like I'm I'm starting to you know even see the outline of it, and and uh, I do want to read it cover to cover. But I I think yeah, just just some of the. Um, like the executive summary exercise would, would really be helpful, I think, maybe for all of us on the committee yeah. is, and definitely for the public, it's a communication tool. Because if someone said, what are you doing? I, I don't have an elevator pitch for them. You know, I can just say, we're trying to save you from the devil. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. When it comes to like, you know, interfacing with the public, we do need to find a way that can, that makes it digestible. Because it, it, it's a lot. It's a ton of information. It is. It is on the technical side. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's see. We don't have anyone from the public to comment at public comment time. That proves our point. That is a disappointment. <laughs> and um, and the only last item on the meeting is to adjourn. So, um, unless there is something else. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for your time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah you thanks, you. David. Thank thanks, you. David. Yeah, Ryan, thank, thank you, you so this, much. This, this is these are always very good conversations, and this was one of them. Yeah, for right. sure. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye. Yeah.